Sure. My name is Ward Griffin, and uh, we're going to do this through audio to start. I'm the um, um, chairperson of the Sustainable Mail Group, and welcome to uh, our sixth symposium uh, from Waste to Wonder, Unveiling the Journey of Recycled Paper. So just quickly on the Sustainable Mail Group, it's a nonprofit member-driven organization that seeks to bring together participants in the direct mail industry from marketer to delivery to help make the industry more environmentally sustainable. And I'm proud today to, uh, to announce that, that we've just released our sustainable direct mail guidelines. This guide helps make your direct mail campaigns more sustainable and is available by contacting us at info at sustainablemailgroup.ca. So please, uh, hopefully you'll look into that. It's quite a good uh, set of guidelines we've developed. So quickly, just um, minor housekeeping details for today's event. We're scheduled from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. You can ask questions using the chat and uh, or the QA function, but the questions won't be answered until the last 10 minutes of the event. The event's being recorded and will be posted to the Sustainable Mail Group's YouTube channel, where you can also find our previous five symposiums. A link to those videos is visible in the chat, if Andrew can get to that while he's trying to get his videos going. Uh, if you don't want to miss any of our content, I recommend you subscribe to our channel and also click on that bell icon, icon when you subscribe so you don't miss any content. Uh, if you like what you see, please consider joining the Sustainable Mail Group at the link provided in the chat and become part of our uh, community. I know it will provide benefits to your company and also give you the opportunity to help the direct mail industry. So if... Uh, Andrew is ready. Let me hand over to our moderator today, Andrew Gustin. Andrew is the executive director of the Sustainable Mail Group and is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the group. He divides his time running SMG and a consulting business focused on helping companies research, develop, and implement sustainable material and operations policies. Andrew has 30 years tenure in corporate sustainability, marketing and mergers and acquisitions. So with that, over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Word. And uh, to everybody on the call, I really do apologize for us with some of the little challenges that we're having with regards to the video here right now. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to rectify them before the end of the session. But nonetheless, most of the content um, is audio related. And, uh, you know, the, the slide decks that we will be showing uh, will provide you with some visuals on top of that. Um, so if everybody's okay with it, can we start possibly by just going through a quick round of introductions for folks, um, starting with uh, Dan Lance. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hi, I'm Dan Lance. I am the owner of Crow's Nest Environmental, a consulting engineering firm. I've got more than 30 years of of uh, experience in the recycling industry. I've done everything from design recycling programs. Andrew's in, in Ottawa. I designed their collection program, for example, for them. I have spent six years in MRF operations with Cascades Recovery. I was the uh, full post-collection system chief operating officer for Green by Nature, with, which was the first implementation of 100% EPR. Uh, so I ran that post-collection network. Uh, I currently do strategic advisory services for circular materials for all of the new EPR programs that are coming on board across Canada. Um, I was part of the team that developed the Golden Design Rules. I know that's plastics related, but it's on everybody's, uh, you know, on everybody's tongue right now talking about plastics. So I was part of the team that developed those, and I'm a certified trainer in, in the Golden Design Rules for Canada. And uh, finally, I've got my doctorate in uh, where I studied the influence of EPR on packaging design. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Thank you. Can we hand it over to Renee? Sure, thank you, Andrew. Renee Yardley, I am the uh, VP of Sales and Marketing for Sustana. So at Sustana, uh, we do recycled paper and fiber. We have three facilities. We have one in uh, uh, Breakyville, Quebec, one in uh, De Pere, Wisconsin on the fiber side, and we have rolling papers in St. Jerome, Quebec. So looking, um, I've been in the paper business for quite some time, over, over 20 years, and uh, look forward to this panel this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Uh, Jean-Sébastien. Yes, uh, I'm John Sebastian. Uh, I'm the VP operation for Sustainable Fiber. 
Uh, I'm with the company since nine years now in the recycling business, uh, but I start as a forest engineer and I was specialized in logistics. So I uh, still in the fiber industry uh, differently, but uh, that's what I do. Thanks, Rhoda Sebastian. Yep. Um, so uh, we've got a number of questions that we've kind of want to want to cover as as Ward mentioned. Um, you know, if you have any questions that you want to ask, feel free to end up putting them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, we'll get around to answering those questions likely at the end of the session. Um, but, you know, there's a possibility that we may be covering off the materials that we, we were going to get into. Um, so maybe the first set really is more focused towards Dan, um, but everyone is welcome to, to chime in. Um, Dan, what's the present state of residential paper and packaging collection in Canada? And would I be wrong to say that 100% of Canadians have access to curbside pickup of paper for recycling? Well, access to recycling uh, for paper and paper packaging is very high in Canada. It's probably 95% plus across the country. Curbside, no, not it won't, isn't that high because there are some rural, uh, remote areas in various provinces where it is just so difficult or the population is so small, it doesn't warrant putting in a truck to go curbside. So, uh, for example, in, in British Columbia, they've got 250 depots that supplement the curbside recycling program. Um, Ontario is more likely to have straight up curbside recycling as is Quebec. Um, so it depends on where you're living. In New Brunswick, for example, which is launching a new EPR program, uh, quite a large percentage of that population, uh, especially all multifamily dwelling residents, they only are serviced by depots. But overall access to recycling, which is really a key component of declaring recyclability um, in Canada is well over 90%. I would suggest it's even north of 95% for paper and paperboard packaging. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned that you had worked on the system in, in Ottawa, um, and I'm most familiar with that program because I live here. Um, and we segregate paper from metals and plastics. Um, is that the norm across the country or is that more the exception? Um, when you look at Canada as a whole, about two thirds of the population collects everything in what's called single stream. So if I don't know what people know, but all of Quebec, for example, is single stream. Ontario, about half is single stream. So where you are, Andrew, is, is two stream. But the city of Toronto, Peel region, York region, they're all single stream collection. So everything's blended together in, in uh, one bin or one cart. When you move out west, then it starts to vary. Manitoba is all single stream, Saskatchewan's all single stream, Alberta is all single stream, but then when you get into BC, it's about 50-50. It's actually a little bit more two stream in, in British Columbia than it is uh, single stream. So it varies by province, but overall in Canada, it's about two thirds of the population has a uh, single stream collection and one third has the system much like you've got in Ottawa, which is two stream fibers and containers. So does that does the, the, the difference in terms of how the processes end up working have an impact in terms of, you know, I mean, we may be getting a little ahead of ourselves, but the quality of the materials that end up coming out of that, is there is there a difference in terms of the output? Uh, yes. Uh, having run both single stream and two stream facilities for Cascades, I can tell you that getting clean fiber streams out of single stream is much more difficult than out of two stream. And two stream the driver can leave anything that's egregious right in the blue box at the curb. In single stream, it's hard to look inside a cart because people tend to hide just about anything and everything in a cart. Uh, single stream fiber contamination, or sorry, two stream fiber contamination rates in collection run around maybe 3%, whereas single stream overall, you know, you're 20 to 35% contamination. So that, when that contamination comes in, it has to be removed single stream recycling at a MRF, a material recovery facility, is much more difficult. They have to separate the fiber from the container. But a lot of things like small plastics, plastic film, um, can end up being with the, can end up in the <clears throat> uh, fiber stream. And so it needs to be removed. Since the National Sword problem happened, the expectation of markets, and I know we have people online, so I won't talk too much to it, but the market expectation is no more than a half of 1% prohibitive material. So in other words, non-fiber going in bales. Uh, a lot of facilities can't get that number, but are getting down below 2% in a lot of instances. 
but that means that 2% of the paper bales are coming in with contamination. It's more likely there will be higher contamination rates from single stream programs where it may get up as high as five, but in two stream programs, it's today you can get paper bales that do meet market specifications. So yes, yeah, single stream certainly does make it more difficult to get the high quality fiber coming out of a MRF. Sorry, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to maybe ask you a question here that kind of a two parted question all around this is that are, and, and maybe you don't know, but like are, are single stream programs or dual stream programs typically more expensive to end up managing on whoever the managing entity might end up being? Well, I've been debating this and looking at this for over 20 years now since uh, development of the first blue box program plan in Ontario. And I'll be honest with you, I just did it again for 2021 Ontario data. It's the only robust data set available in, in the country. Uh, that's available to be reviewed. And I can tell you right now that single stream programs do not recover as much material and are more expensive than two stream programs. I know it sounds counterintuitive because everybody's been telling everybody for so long that single stream causes an increase in recovery and a decrease in cost. But honestly, I've written so many papers on it and you can look at even today's numbers and it just doesn't hold water. It, it, single stream programs are more expensive and end up with lower overall recovery rates than two stream programs in Canada. Is is that, uh, sorry, and I mean, I'm you know, the, 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 there is a question that I want to ask about, you know, how these programs typically end up getting funded, but is, is in your estimation, the cost of administering the program stem from the material recovery out of the program, or is there some other element that comes into play there? Generally speaking, collecting single stream is easier because it's just a cart at the curb with an automated collection system, whereas boxes need to be handled manually. So the collection side is, is less expensive, but as I mentioned with the, uh, the contamination rates in a two stream program might be 6% or 8%, whereas in a single stream program, it can be 30% or more. And when it goes to the recycling facility, the MRF, the material recovery facility be separated. Now you have to handle 30% more material in other words, 10 tons comes in, you've only got seven tons that you're going to send to market. And as a result, you're paying at so much for processing out those three out of every 10 tons that shouldn't be there, that it flips the, the scales over to make single stream much more expensive, or not much more, but significantly more expensive than two stream. So it is a, it is a function of the, the collection system that's put in place. And so here's here's the, the the next bit then is is that and again this isn't the same virtually everywhere but um, we had a session um, focused on extended producer responsibility last year the link to that video is actually in the chat if anybody wants to link forward to it um, and we will share it on our YouTube channel later but um, how do the programs end up getting paid for across the country? Uh, they're all paid for the same way. When Once it moves to 100% <clears throat> producer responsibility, whether it's IPR, individual producer responsibility, or just extended producer responsibility, so as a group, then it's paid for by the stewards. So rolling papers on the call, their steward, uh, blah, blah, all the retailers, um, you know, anybody that's a consumer products, goods manufacturer, McCain, you, you name it, whoever's manufacturing goods, has to pay their share of the program in each province. The EPR programs are different in every single province. There, there's no two alike, but it all comes down to the producers pay 100% of the cost. Um, well, not everywhere yet, but it's all moving to 100% fully funded uh, producer responsibility programs across Canada. And the timelines for implementation vary depending, and I've got the data, but I don't know how much time you want to take on uh, wanting to know who rolls out at when moving okay. to 100 percent thanks dan so once paper has been collected it goes somewhere and where does it typically end up going it's going to markets primarily uh north america where it's possible depends where you are on the west coast um more material does flow overseas to uh, some materials moving as far as india now but generally speaking, North American fiber stays in North America. There's a lot of capacity and increasing capacity uh, for mixed paper. It, it used to be, well, I'll tell you, uh, people want to know how paper has changed in, in Canada. In about around 2009, newspapers were 20 to 25% of the material collected in uh, the fiber stream. 
and corrugated boxes. Um, so think about it, your Amazon box, everybody understands that, uh, was about 20%. Today, it's about 45, 40 to 45% corrugated boxes and only 3% newspapers. So 15 years ago, we were sorting newspapers as a separate stream and they were going back to newspaper mills. Today, there's so little newspaper left in the marketplace that uh, facilities just don't even bother sorting this, the newspaper. Minor, minor, minor exceptions. In New Brunswick, for example, they deals, they still do pull New Brunswick out in some areas because there's a mill that wants newspaper and they get a premium for it. But it takes a long time to get a, a truckload. Uh, so now it's just corrugated and so boxes and then mixed paper. So again, like I said, mixed paper capacities are increasing because the mills are getting better and they all have their own recipes and they all have their own mixes and they have their preferred customers to give them the exact blend they want to handle uh, that they can use in their mills. And I'll let the others on this call speak to that. Um, but for a lot of it does stay right here in North America, most of it. So if you, if you don't mind, let's just stay inside a, a MRF, so a municipal recycling facility, right? Um, materials received from you know, the curbside programs, um, in you know in those cases where there are separate streams for paper versus plastics and and metals um how does how does the mixed stuff get sorted like what what is there an automated process or are there people on the line picking stuff out by hand and then as part of that what are some of the key issues with paper at a MRF that it results in it either being streamed to a landfill or possibly being recycled um, it depends on the size of the facility and the age of the facility. The newer facilities are getting more and more automated. To be honest, those of you who have never sorted or seen a recycling facility, it's not a fun job sorting sorting materials. Um, it's very labor. It's it's hard on you. It's labor intensive. It's tiring. Uh, it's dusty. It's dirty, et cetera. Um, so it's not a preferred job for many people. Um, so it's really hard to get sorters. So the industry has moved more and more to automation of the sorting process. For the containers, <clears throat> a lot of it is done now using what's called an optical sorter. It is a system where they use a visible and near infrared camera that looks down on a belt and can identify each material that's on there for all the plastics. They also use it for aseptic and polycoated cartons, for example, on the paperboard side. They can, to be honest, uh, optical sorting can also be used for aluminum, but generally they use what's called an eddy current separator for aluminum and a steel magnet for steel. So they come off. A glass screen is used to remove the glass because glass always breaks in the recycling process. So it gets very small, typically down to two in less than five centimeters and it drops through a screen and it's recycled separately. But for the plastics, they use optical sortation. They typically do use um, a lot of manual sortation for quality control, but it, compared to what it would be like doing it manually, it's a tenth the number of people that are required to get there. With respect to the paper that is more difficult to manage and doesn't necessarily go where we want it to go, one of the biggest, um, I don't want to call it a problem material because they're working on it, but one of the hardest to keep going where we necessarily want it to go, and it depends on markets, is things like inside poly-coated paper cups or the takeout containers. So, you know, everybody, we, you know, they're now eliminating all the polystyrene clamshells for your, all your takeout food because it's a problematic, they call it a problematic plastic. It's being replaced by inside polycoated paper. Well, the thing is that inside polycoating isn't necessarily compatible depending on the mill that it's going to. Some mills can take inside polycoating, some mills can't take inside polycoating. The other thing is when it gets into a recycling facility, if it gets flattened, it'll end up with the paper, which means it goes to mixed paper. If it stays three-dimensional, like a coffee cup, um, it will end up on the container side. And if it goes on the container side, then it gets found. It may not get found at all because the um, aseptic juice boxes and milk cartons have an outside poly coating layer. And that's what the optical sorter looks for. They don't look for paper because if they did, they get all the paper that inadvertently ends up on the container side, which is a, can be a big issue um, for the, uh, particularly for single screen programs. So if that's the case, then those containers may not get captured um, and go to recycling. If they happen to go through the optical sorter face up, they might get captured by the optical sorter and get ejected with the polycoated cartons. And then again, depending on the mill, aseptic mills typically don't like brown fiber, they want white fiber. 
and so they don't really like the brown um so but it is there so they do they can manage it but only to limited amounts and again it depends on the mill so it's a, a rather complicated answer um but if they don't capture it there there's a good likelihood it will end up going to the residue stream which will on a container side might go to alternative fuel and in some instances it depending on again where you are and your access to making alternative fuel for things like the cement industry it may go to landfill i don't want to say what percentage because it all depends on the facility Right. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You answered a question that I think comes up later um, in our stream of stuff. Um, did, 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 like, did, did, offhand, do you have an idea as to how much material that gets into a MRF might end up getting, at, like at a really macro level, getting recycled versus getting landfilled? A well-run recycling system should be able to capture at least 95% or about, I won't say at least, should be able to capture 94 to 95% of the material that goes inbound to the recycling system. <clears throat> the amount that goes to landfill would be the remainder unless they have some of it that might go to alternative fuel. For right. example, the program that I ran in British Columbia, uh, we were capturing about 94%, 94.5% was going to recycling, about 2% was going to alternative fuel. So that's the non-recyclable plastics that come in like number seven plastics, for example and uh about three percent approximately was going to landfill so a well-run system is very efficient at capturing all the recyclables that come into the system it does vary though i know there are programs that don't do nearly that well but uh a good one can do that that well thanks dan um let's let's move on a little bit now because i think we've kind of you know because we want to we want to go through this whole you know sequentially um and and ask some questions to renee and jean sebastien um and i think the first one that ends up inevitably coming to mind is is that um you folks are a fairly integrated organization and i think it it would benefit people to understand um the the uh, that, those aspects of, of your company so either one of you or both of you perhaps i mean could you possibly kind of walk us through about you know what what the is all about and what the company ends up doing okay i'll well, I'll start and then i'll let to js it says my name but it's jean sebastien Poissy, who is is our uh, uh vp of operations in in breakable so he can really give um in depth uh, information about the the processing in our recycling plant. So at Sustana, we like to say that we bring, bring paper and fiber products full service, uh, full circle, sorry, um, by de delivering on our commitment to continuous improvement and environmental stewardship. So in our company, um, I mentioned at the beginning, we have Sustana, Sustana Fiber, and uh, th that is a uh, recycled fiber mill, and we have rolling paper. And so we take the fibers from our recycled fiber mill and we make it into uh, recy recycled paper. And so uh, we, we provide these uh, fiber and paper solutions to customers throughout, throughout North America. Um, I should also note it's, as it's a, rel a recently uh, new acquisition for us. Um, we've also uh, acquired HANA paper. So we've gone backward into the supply chain. So in the, in the recycling end, what HANA paper does is they pick up uh, used office papers and bring it into our uh, recycled uh, facility. Um, so we use, you know, Dan had, had talked about that. We use a number of uh, automated proprietary processes to uh, turn recovered paper into high quality recycled fiber. We use that for printing papers, tissue grades, uh, molded fiber, packaging, packaging. And um, we also produce our EnviroLife pulp, which is a sustainable recycled fiber that's compliant with FDA standards for food, food packaging. Um, Roland, Roland Paper, so uh, at Roland Paper, uh, we make recycled commercial paper and security. Uh, also, we have a small business in uh, uh, security papers. Um, it, our manufacturing facility is powered by renewable energy, primarily biogas. 94% of our uh, energy needs are with uh, with biogas. 
that's captured from landfill waste, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And um, our Enviro line of products has their smallest environmental footprint uh, in the North American industry. Thanks, Renee. Um, you know, I think Dan kind of got it into this question and I, I'm, I, I realize that there's, there's a lot of moving pieces towards this, but like say for instance, um, you guys ended up receiving uh, the term used was an aseptic container or a lined paper cup. Um, would you be able to use that material in any of the process? Are there customers that may end up being willing to pick up that fiber from you guys? Well, we do, and I'll let uh, uh, Jean Sebastien talk talk about that. But um, with our proprietary processes, we are able to uh, extract the fiber from it. Uh, JS, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll go. So, yeah, with uh, let's see, starting in the 2020, we start doing that business of using uh, aseptic gable tops, so poly both side. Uh, we were already able to uh, process uh, poly cup poly one side. Uh, so yeah, we actually, we were working with the local um, recycling facility uh, that they can supply us with, uh, let's say 3,000 to 4,000 tons a year of uh, aseptic gable top. So we are removing uh, fibers and uh, of course uh, we separate the, uh, the poly from the, 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 the good fibers. What, what we are looking for, it's uh, white fiber, since we are in the uh, recycling, uh, the, the bleach craft uh, pulp. So, uh, but we can eat some um, aseptic with brown, but it doesn't really matter when it's less than 10, 15%. So yeah, we do this here in Quebec and also at the Wisconsin facility in the US. Thanks. That, that's interesting because I mean it's been a an area that I've found very difficult to quite understand fully because um, the 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 I think I think you need to be able to kind of look at it down to a micro level at the municipality as to whether those kinds of materials can can be accepted, but then also where those municipal municipal recycling facilities then end up diverting those materials to other to other mills. So it's a, it's a yes and no answer, I guess, as to whether or not you know, lined cups can possibly end up being recycled. It really all depends on who receives them, right? Correct. And uh, when we start doing this, uh, of course, no, no, nobody was really ready to ship bales to us. So we were, we had to go, let's say, in the New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and so. But after a few months, few years, now our local uh, sort sorting facility were uh, were able to do the old uh, the, the old thing we were able to do. So now that 3,000, 4,000 tons is what they can provide us when it was only 300 tons the first year. So uh, the goal for us is to always go and grow that uh, that business and extend a little bit more the uh, the the volume of a septic gable top that we can use. And we know already that uh, just in Quebec, we all uh, we have the possibility to go get that uh, probably fifteen thousand tons metric of aseptic. Uh, so there's a, a big market there that we want to enter in a little bit more deeper. Interesting. So um... I, think, I, I think we should add a, a, a little bit here too. Um, you know, we, we really, during during the pandemic, when we couldn't get sorted office papers, we, as JS mentioned, we really increased our, our use of the aseptic and gable top uh, containers. And um, JS, do you want to talk about the, the shredder a little bit um, and, and, what that, and what that does for us in terms of the, of the fiber? Yeah, of course, uh, doing this, uh, that type of material, it's a little bit, uh, of course, it's really good fiber, like I said before. So it's it's okay to go and in, invest a little bit times and money in that uh, new operation. So uh, to be able to crunch the, uh, the, the the fiber and extract the fiber from that con those content, we had to uh, shred uh, the, 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 those things to be able to have that water coming coming in the uh, the continent to get the uh, the fiber out. So we had to invest uh, three quarter of a million uh, in a big shredder, industrial shredder, to do a first pass of on those bales to uh, to cut cut them in pieces. I mean the continent, and now with the pulp, the, the pulper we have. 
uh, we put energy, of course, water, and we, uh, with time, we are able to uh, really uh, defibrate the, uh, the, 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 the material. So, and after that, we, it's enter in our, uh, our process of screening, washing. Uh, we have a disperger uh, step also to, to detach the ink and everything. And uh, at the end, we have a, a final product where the, the, the fiber is clean at 99%. You guys shared with me a uh, a slide kind of detailing the process kind of from cradle to to, to cradle. Um, would you like me to? Because I've got some questions related to how those materials get segregated, what goes into the process of differentiating the both the pulp and the the the, the final product into various streams. So, uh, would you guys be okay if I put that slide up? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Can everybody see that? Yep. So, um, so you you get materials um, from a from a waste sort uh, waste source collected and then sorted. Um, what's the 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 sorting process for you when you receive them, and then how do you evaluate those materials and what they can possibly you know, provide in terms of streams of, of pulp that can be used either by yourselves or by somebody else? Okay, so we, uh, we are working with different uh, sorting company, of course, uh, close to the mill. We can go get the paper, the waste paper from, uh, let's say, uh, a thousand kilometers from the mill. So, uh, of course, that material is coming to the mill from those uh, sorting facilities in uh, bale format. So, um, I arrive at the mill, we have different grades. We have a sorted office ways. We can get a printer mix, a coded book uh, coming from magazine and different things like that. Uh, so we we have some recipe. It depends the, what grade we want to produce. Because like we said, we are producing pulp uh, at Bricky Villa for a paper company like Roland uh, Paper at St. Jerome. Uh, of course, packaging stuff. We can do tissue business also, like napkins and different things like that. So depends on what customers we are targeting. We produce, we, we use a different recipe and we, with, with different paper mix. We put this in the in the, the process. We clean that pulp. We arrive with different uh, uh, qu pulp quality in terms of brightness, uh, dirt content and everything. So, and, and we are able to ship to those uh, those uh, company. So Roland is one of, of the bigger one, uh, one of the, my bigger customers, of course. So uh, after that, they do the paper for the uh, for the market, and we recover at that, at that that paper right after with different sorting com company again, like and a paper uh, that we own right now. So and and that paper is coming back to the mill after being used. At a macro level, um, you know, and I mean, I mean, I guess I, I you know, it, 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 this would be different for different companies, but um, can you provide some insight around how much of the collected material that you guys end up receiving? And, and just to back up a bit here, because I think that, you know, the initial portion of the discussion was around curbside recycling, but you also end up collecting materials um, from you know the the what, what what I think would be classified as the ICNI sector, which would be you know potentially office towers or printers and the like, which may not end up making it to curbside. But once that material is collected, um, it gets converted into pulp. Um, like where where would it go to? Like how much of that could possibly be used in things like corrugated and packaging? How much of it could be used possibly in towel and tissue? And how much of it is in printing paper? Like you know what are look like is packaging and talent issue the bulk of where it ends up going or or what what are the what does the breakdown look like so Andrew, that would really depend on the mill so so we do uh white fiber right so it, so our fiber is not going into corrugate so it is um from our uh, breaking valve facility um i would say that like half is going into printing and writing um, 25% perhaps to packaging in, in like liner 
uh, liner board, and then another uh, portion of that would go into tissue. So it it really depends on on the the market at that that particular time. Okay. Um, so given our interest, um, because I suspect the vast majority of individuals who are on this call are, are in some way or another focused on either the printing or the direct marketing business. Um, once the pulp has ended up being produced, what's the process to actually produce it into something that, you know, a printer could possibly end up using? So, so once that once the pulp has has been produced, so it it ships to the 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 rolling paper mill, and then we uh, we manufacture it into paper. And we have two lines of papers: our one hundred percent recycled papers and our thirty percent recycled papers. And as I mentioned, we have a very specialized security business. And so then, with those 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 papers, they go to the distributors and then right down to to the printers. So our mill has basis weights of forty pounds to up to one hundred and twenty pounds. So uh, it, it's going into items like direct mail, brochures, uh, you know, lots of uh, marketing collateral in general. Um, it, are the are the processes once you end up receiving the pulp any different from what you would end up receiving like virgin pulp in that case? No, not at all, not at okay. all. It's, uh, it's it's by the by the time that 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 recycled fiber reaches the the, the paper mill, the, the it's no it's it, the only difference is there's a a lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we we attributed that coming from the circular economy because we we are not having the early parts of the uh, the the processing in it and that's all detailed in our LCAs and we are going uh, or sorry I shouldn't use acronyms life cycle assessments and we are updating those life cycle assessments uh, for 2023 uh, with the new information that we that we have. So um, just just a, 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 a point of clarification here, because I think there's a, 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 a there, there's, you know, been a narrative that's kind of come about, but um, does the system need virgin fiber in order to function or can you recycle fiber an infinite number of times? Well, well we are, go, go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, when we are talking about that uh, recycling mill here in Brickyville, I mean, we don't use uh, any uh virgin fiber i mean it's only re re recycling uh, uh, fibers so um uh, and uh of course i, I will let uh, say, renee talk about saint jerome the, the paper mill uh for the grade uh, renee yeah sure so I, I mean like fiber cannot be recycled an infinite uh, amount of time we we it, it gets recycled about seven times and then the fibers become too short to be used in the process. So there is, I mean, what's coming into our mill could have been created with virgin fiber. But I think the important thing to notice is, is with all of this is the investment in the circular economy in that we, we continue to recycle the, the, the products that were made from virgin fibers so that we're using the resources as best as possible in, and to continue that instead of instead of wasting it and, and putting it in landfill. Um, I know that Dan answered this a little bit and Renee, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, has the pandemic and office closures had, a, had an impact on on the kinds of materials that you're you're re receiving right now, or you know, has you know both in terms of volume, but also in terms of the types of materials. So I would say in the during the height of the pandemic, obviously we closed all the schools, offices, and government buildings. So as as we mentioned, you know, we have uh, a, one of our collectors is Hannah Hannah Paper. So that um, that was not available, right, for us to pick up that those fiber sources from from the office. So JS had mentioned that earlier, serendipity. We had visited the Montreal recycling facility, and so we really augmented our 
uh, sorted off its papers with the aseptic and gable top uh, containers at that point. As we see the return to work, um, our, our, the collections have obviously increased as all of those facilities are generating waste, uh, office waste that is that's being collected at, at this point in time. But I just I just wanted to note too that you know we we're um, in 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 the U.S. Uh, you know we're members of FPI, the Food Packaging in Institute. So you know we're always looking um, ways with them and the Carton Council so that that we can uh, increase recycling of the of what was mentioned earlier, the cartons and the uh, the, the paper cups, and they've actually. Um, instituted a, a number of MRFs now are, are taking the, the paper cups and a number of paper mills have accepted that those come in the, in primarily in the US in the mixed sales. So uh, re realizing that the, 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 the bulk of the fiber that is coming through to be used in 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 the in the printing paper side of the side side of 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 the the pulp equation, um, but there's still some materials that you know go through MRF and go through the sorting process um, th that that could be streamed into into paper. If you were, you know, providing some insight to somebody in the direct mail industry um, a while about what they could do to ensure that their you know, printed piece of collateral has a higher rate of recycling, what what would you, you know, what insight would you pro provide to them? Like if you were to tell them, you know, some things that you could possibly end up doing that would, you know, in, you know, ensure that this item gets recycled to the highest value possible, what would you say to them? Well, first of all, I'd say to use products that contain recycled fiber, right? So sort of for their direct mail there, I mean that the the printing of those uh, of those products they are I, in the past there was a perception that perhaps they didn't print as well. I can sh uh, show you lots of examples where they they you cannot tell the difference between a recycled product and a a, a virgin fiber product. Um, and and you know I think we want to make sure that we identify that the product is recyclable so that you know whether whoever is receiving that product knows that it can be recycled I think that's one of the things we see with consumers is that you know consumers want with all of the our climate uh, challenges out there they want to help in this and one of the things that they tell us they want to do is to recycle and so the, so educating consumers about what can be recycled is uh, is very important um does anybody i think we can move on to questions from from the 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 overall the uh, attendees or whatnot unless somebody else has something to to contribute to the to to this life cycle discussion dan jean sebastien renee please go ahead okay so um i've got a question here from holly denson camp um you guys should be able to see it in the q a but i'll read it out to everybody so how do you respond to the push narrative that tree cover is actually increasing in North America. Therefore, virgin fiber can't be that bad to continue harvesting. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, so we, well, you know, I, I, that, that's a really, uh, that's an interesting question um, to, to respond to that. That, you know, we, the, the, I mean, our focus is on recycled products. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, the Santa is, is we're not harvesting, um, uh, harvesting trees. We don't have forestry operations. We say that our forest is the, is the urban forest. So I, I honestly, um, I can't really respond to that. I do, I have, I've seen that um, you know that they say there is no 
uh, deforestation in Canada. And a lot of it goes to agricultural use when there is deforestation. So, um, you know, from, from the paper industry perspective, I think our, our focus is on increasing the rate of paper recycling. Yeah, that's a... I can, I can add a little bit to that, Andrew. The, you know, Renee touched on it that paper is not infinitely recyclable. So if we don't continue to add some virgin fiber to the mix, ultimately Renee would be out of business because the paper breaks down after seven to 10 times. And after 10 times, if we didn't harvest or didn't have any virgin fiber to put into the mix, there wouldn't be any paper left to recycle. So we do need some virgin fiber put into the mix in order to keep the circular economy going. I know it sounds weird to say that, that you're adding virgin to keep the circular economy going, but um, we need some just to keep the long fiber in the mix so that Renee and, and uh, Sistana and, and Roland can continue to make the fiber they do. The good news, the, the thing is that what they're doing in, in re paper recycling rates in Canada are extremely high, like as a country as a whole, residentially, we're capturing 90 plus percent of all the corrugated. We're capturing probably 80, 75 to 80 percent of all the box board uh, mixed papers out of the household, including direct mails a little lower than that. But we're doing a reasonably good job as a country to capture all the fiber that's put into the household. I see and I is a different story. I can't, I don't have enough data to touch on that. But if we continue to do a good job, again, through the recycling process, it still breaks down and we do need some virgin fiber to keep that cycle going. And I suspect that that, I mean, you know, not to, this, this, this is a little bit anecdotal, but I mean, I suspect that that holds true in almost any, any, any process. I mean, any closed loop mechanism will have some kind of leakage um, in it somewhere. It just takes different forms. So um, I, I, I can definitely end up understanding that. Um, I just don't know if we have any other questions from the field. Um, we're coming close to the end of our time here. Does anybody have any closing comments? But I, before I kind of get into the uh, the outro and remind everybody here. Okay, well, thank you to all of our panelists for today's seminar. I, I apologize again that we couldn't get the video working, um, uh, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, everybody's uh, <clears throat> headshot uh, in the invitation and in the, uh, in the YouTube video. We end up sending out. Um, I just want to reiterate a couple of quick set of points before we to call it a day. Uh, the session has been recorded, so if there's anybody who you know wants to rewind through any of the commentary that's been made um, or wants to share it with somebody, it'll be posted to our YouTube channel in the coming days. Uh, a note will be sent out to everybody, whether they attended the session or not, um, who registered for the event when that video gets posted. Um, if you enjoyed the event, please share that video with your colleagues and to stay on top of our content, uh, please subscribe to our channel and click on the bell so you'll be notified uh, of any new content that gets posted. Um, in order to produce this content, we do encourage everybody to join the Sustainable Mail Group. Um, we've got um, a second half of the year um, offer on the now for a discounted membership. Um, and if you log on to the join us um, link that I shared previously in the commentary, you'll be able to see what that is. The more people that become part of the community, the better we can fund useful content such as this. Um, and stay tuned as we will be posting invitations to our next event soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the, to the panelists for having attended. And thank you for the attendees for making it into this session.